Hey, my friend. Want to help me test out a theory? Or maybe it's more me making a statement. But by sticking to the end of this video, you'll be able to assist me, so let's get started. Anyway, in this video, I want to prove that I can teach you how to analyze and then strategize how to approach almost anything by simply explaining what I would be looking for when beginning a game. And now I have three points to this, but this is probably also going to be more RPG focused because that's what I know and like, but we'll see how this goes. Now the reason I think this is possible is that there are principles or rules in play in life. They determine how things worked and kind of the rules of the universe, like the law of gravity. And once we understand these rules, we can then use them to our benefit or understand how to reach our goals while these laws are in action. It's kind of like we need to understand the law of gravity works so we can use things like the pulleys or levers or even how to escape the atmosphere in a rocket. We need to be aware of how they work and how much strength they're exerting to actually kind of realize what we need to do. And the thing with games is that they are pretty much all rule-based. Now there are some that are just wide open sandboxes where you can do almost anything you want just as long as you have the controls for it. But for the most part, you have to operate within set parameters to reach a specified goal. Which brings up my first point of analysis in what is the goal? Because without that, what is the point of analysis? Now with games, it may be building a successful city of parts, solving puzzles, reaching the end of the level, finding treasure, defeating bosses, surviving waves of enemies, or even just having fun by making our own challenge. It is kind of interesting to see how many people want to speedrun a game or complete it with a certain controller or just say, oh, I'm going, only going to use this level or rarity of character, or I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, I don't want to get hit, whatever it is, but they're challenging themselves. And I'm at least assuming it's fun, or at least it gives a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> and then sometimes we may just want to enjoy a game. And in real life, our goals may be building a business, a relationship, or even beginning a process of growth and health, fitness, mindset, whatever it is, ourselves. But whatever we are going to do, it helps to know both the start and the end of it. Of at least the current challenge we're facing, at least. Because the thing with dames in that life, light life, they may have one overarching goal. Like in life, it may be, we want to leave a legacy that will impact generations. Or as a dame, we're trying to save the world from the evil villain. But there are also little, lots of little ones along the way. It's like, you, in order to leave a legacy, you might have to trade an organization or raise a family. Whereas in a dame, you might have to defeat a uh, couple generals of the main villain before you actually get to the main villain. So we may have to go back to analyzing over and over again as we face those new mountains to climb. But once we know the dolls, then we can look at what tools and people are available to help us, which is my second point. So we can start that by considering the Trinity of Wolves, DPS, Taint, and Support, the very common setup that a lot of dames use. Summed up, we can basically view this as, who do we need to accomplish the task? Of course, balance is affinity thing, so sometimes one of these trumps the others. So while in general all the roles need to be filled, sometimes the support can actually has the damage and the survivability to basically carry. And even in other games that are kind of live service where they're constantly updating and vulnerable to power creep. So the DPS is a lot easier to kind of give bitter numbers to than having a taint or support gain more utility or whatever. Like in bitter numbers, easy to add. Whereas if you have something that has utility, it's probably going to be worth more in the long run. So you developers are generally careful with adding that. Now we can't really put people or tools into classes or walls like that, but we can ask, okay, what still sets or tools are needed for a job? And then if we don't have access to those we can then either seek to try out those skills or tools, or we tend to elaborate with someone who does. And in fact, even some dames don't make it as easy as, okay, we need one, two, three, as there to be multiple ways of fulfilling these roles. It's like, let's take an archer, for example. They may be a damage dealer, or they may, or there can even be additional roles that need to be filled. So you may need ranged now that comes from the archer, or the mage who can heal and do range, or whatever, or the munt 
who's healing and doing damage, however it works. And then you can also have the jack of all trades, master of none, often better than a master of one. I really like that trope because it kind of plays into the saying of, yes, you can have someone who's dead out of multiple different things, but sometimes while you may need a specific specialist for a lot of samples, you can kind of make do with an average a person who is kind of the average of everything but or have the still set of an average or who can at least understand it but then sometimes you may not actually need to know every single thing about the business but if you at least know how to do it you could probably consider yourself a jack of all trades or at least how to understand and communicate with the people who do but that's kind of besides the point but the other thing, and the third and final point, is actually knowing what actually matters to the doll. Now, I play a lot of selection-based games, which are generally pretty character-focused in what they kind of attract you with, but depending on the game, it's not always the characters that don't make the strongest attempt, or the flashy characters at least. And then it's kind of that thing of the DPS or the support. Sometimes it can be equipment, cards, or other items that are far more important, just because they can be used for multiple characters or teams, allowing you to switch out as needed, or as new characters get released that have bitter numbers and so forth. And even some of these games can actually be based on having the roster depth to complete content rather than having a main character team. Like, there may be games that locked out teams as you use them, so you have to kind of keep coming up with new setups to complete new missions and so forth rather than just relying on this okay this character will tear me account wait a minute i can't use them anymore <laughs> another time way of doing this is to bring in elements so you have stuff like fire water plant light ice wind lightning earth and darkness and whatever else you want to add in and it's kind of amazing how different elemental systems can work Sometimes there's a countering setup like fire will be vulnerable to water, but it will also beat ice. And sometimes it may be purely resistant. So like, okay, these enemies are weak to fire, but this next enemy is weak to earth. So do I need to bring in the midst of the team or do I need a team for each patch of content? Or you may even have something like Denshin Impact, which is based on the elements reacting with one another, so you kind of need a mix of multiple different elements to kind of do whatever you want it is. And you can kind of think of it as knowing the industry you're in, since certain things will work in one and not the other, just like how you may know the element system of certain name, but that is likely useless when it comes to another. Take, think of being a marketer, for example. You may be marketing a beauty product at one point, like anti-aging serum and so forth, but then you may be told on to market tools at another point. And so it's like, how you would market both of those would probably be very different, even though there might be some principles in place, but you would still have to think about how your copy is, all that kind of things, rather than just trying to say, oh, what well, works for one works for the other. Now, I will admit this is probably really bare bones lesson in te trying to teach strategy and analysis, but I hope it at least provided some food for thought for you as you move towards your goals. So in closing, I want to ask, do you think I proved my point? Did I teach strategy and analysis using games? Let me know if I did or if I completely failed in the comments below. And if you liked this video, why not share it with someone you know? Anyway, I'm Jonah. You've been watching Lions May Media, where we celebrate stories and what they teach us in all the forms they tell in. Talk to you later, and have a great rest of your day.